Good afternoon. I am Christopher Miller, Senior Director, Education and Community Engagement here at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, we welcome you to Unmasking the Realities. Launched in June of 2020, this virtual series was curated to spark meaningful conversations that tackle uncomfortable contemporary topics related to injustice and inequities. The goal of these conversations is to provoke constructive action towards justice and equity. The Black Lives Matter movement formed in 2013 has been a focal part of the movement against police brutality in the US. In fact, interactions between the police and the black community has been an issue of concern for centuries. Last year, we witnessed the largest mass protest in US history. And at the core of the protest was the matter of police violence against the black community. Before I introduce our outstanding panel and dive into our conversation, we have a brief message from our sponsor, Gallagher Insurance. Uh, and uh, representing Gallagher Insurance is Rodney Johnson. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate that. You know, Gallagher, uh, uh, this is the third year of our partnership with the Freedom Center. And we're so excited to continue to find ways to collaborate and really build upon uh, their organizational efforts to make sure that people in this country, around this world, understand the truths of our past and are really proactively working to make sure we continue to drive meaningful change around freedom, diversity, inclusion, equity, and of course, social justice. We're particularly excited to be sponsoring the Unmask and the Realities event and this subject of law and order. As we reflect process and continue to work towards driving meaningful change, resulting from the painful murders of people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and really countless others. We know it starts by having these very tough and very honest conversations to move forward and ensure history won't repeat itself. The saying goes, each time history repeats itself, the price goes up. With that said, we're extremely thankful for our partnership with the Freedom Center and all of their amazing work and contributions in bringing to light the importance, the relevance, and the struggles for freedom around the world, throughout history, and today. I'm also honored uh, to be part of such a distinguished panel and thankful for uh, this group and their collective efforts to bring about measurable change. Thank you all for joining us today and attending what is certain to be a powerful discussion. Chris? Thank you, Rodney. Last year, we held a remarkable conversation through this platform in regards to law enforcement with law enforcement officers. And this is somewhat an extension of that conversation. Major Earl Price with the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office was a contributor to the conversation and he passed away earlier this year. Major Price was taking a lead role in addressing matters of systemic racism from his uh, sphere of influence in law enforcement. Our continued condolences to the family, friends, and colleagues of Major Earl Price. Now I want to provide a little bit of historical context to our conversation. Uh, we are a museum that fosters and promotes history and greater understanding. And when often we hear politicians and uh, um, public officials talk about being a country of law and order, it's very important that we take the necessary action to look back and see exactly how law and order has played out in our society. The early stirrings of law and order politics in the US occurred in the 1830s during the Underground Railroad era. In response to agitation for expansion of voting rights. At the time, only whites who owned property could vote, and there was a movement to extend the franchise to all white men. The governor of Rhode Island formed the Law and Order Party to oppose such proposals of expanding voting rights. Troubled by an influx of immigrants, his party wanted to preserve the state charter that disenfranchised the 60% of the state's white male residents who did not own property. 15 years later, another law and, or, law and order party 
emerged, this time in Kansas. It promoted the cause of slavery. Pro-slavery activists convened at Leavenworth, Kansas to form the Law and Order Party, which cited criminal violence as justification to target, attack, and arrest persons associated with the free state cause. As we advance the scope of law and order to present day, we are joined by an outstanding panel. Joining us today, we have Chief Mitchell R. Davis from the village of Hazelcrest, Illinois. We also have attorney and retired Hamilton County judge here in Cincinnati, Ohio, Fanon Rucker. And we also have Chief Kevin H. Williams, Interim Assistant Vice President for Police at Middle Tennessee State University Police Department. And unfortunately, uh, Chief Darrell Goins, Assistant Police Chief from Richmond, Virginia, was not able to join us today, but we are excited to have uh, our panel that we have here today. Thank you to all of you for joining us and taking the time for this meaningful conversation. And so at this time, I want to uh, further uh, allow our uh, participants to get to know each of you a little more. Uh, and I will start with uh, Fanon, um, but uh, how many years of experience do you have in your profession and why did you choose your profession? Well, thank you so much for uh, putting this, putting this uh, webinar on. It truly is an important conversation and uh, I, I, I obviously locally appreciate all the work that you do and that the Freedom Center does to educate uh, folks around the country. So I have been a lawyer since 1996. Uh, I've started off as a prosecutor. I was prosecuted for several years. And then I went into private practice where I practiced civil rights and employment discrimination, mostly plaintiff's work. I became the law director for a city, writing the laws and representing public officials. And then I ran for a DA or county prosecutor. In 2007, at 35 years old, I became a judge where I sat for almost 13 years, um, presided over several hundred thousand cases, all types of uh, cases. And then in 2019, I retired and joined the Cochran Law Firm, where I currently sit as a practicing attorney. I went to law school specifically because while I was at Hampton as a junior, had, had just pledged, I, like the rest of the country, saw Rodney King uh, being assaulted by LA police officers. And those officers were arrested they were indicted and they were acquitted because of legal wrangling. It was that flashbulb in our country's history that made me decide I wanted to be a lawyer, not just a lawyer, I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. And so uh, that's how I got into the field. It was specifically seeing a, a, a corporal injustice occurring and me wanting to do something about it. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Chief Davis. Thank you so much for having me this evening. It's an honor to be here with my esteemed colleagues and fraternity brothers. Um, I've been in my profession for 30 years. Uh, and how I came here is I, I didn't choose this profession. Uh, I believe God put me here and I was chosen to be where I am. And the reason I say that is uh, when I graduated from, from high school in 1980, uh, I went to school for engineering and ended up becoming a computer programmer and was a computer programmer for about eight years. And uh, after eight years of being a computer programmer, I worked in corporate America and the company that I worked work for got bought out by another company and they downsized and they got rid of their data processing department and, and I got fired. So uh, having been fired and having a child, a wife, having just bought a home, uh, I was at a minority job fair at DePaul University. Just, I gotta support my family. That's my mindset. I can't be picky, I gotta support my family and law enforcement was never on my radar. And after going to this minority job fair, uh, passing out resumes, I was contacted by a police department in the South suburbs of Chicago, where I had grown up at, uh, not in that specific community, but in that general area. And uh, they were hiring three people. Uh, when I showed up to the orientation, there was about 500 people at the orientation. And out of that 500 and so people, uh, I was number two out of three that was hired. And you know, speaking of, of Rodney King, uh, the judge just talked about uh, being in college. Well, Rodney King happened right after I be about right after I became a police officer. So you know, I, I, I took it quite honestly as a job. But I'm one of those that if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it wholeheartedly. 
And, uh, you know, I became a law enforcement officer. I was about 28 years old. And uh, with Rodney King happening and, and just my personal experiences as a black man, uh, having known how the police treat the, the black community, uh, I just took on that uh, that challenge. And I took on that, that God put me here, that if I'm going to be here, I'm going to do right by my people. I'm going to be the best professional that I can. And, you know, 30 years later, uh, I'm, I'm now a police chief and I've been blessed to be able to be in a position right now where I can actually make meaningful impact. And that's what it's all about for me. Thank you, Chief Davis. And uh, Chief Williams. Well, good evening and good afternoon, depending upon where you're at in the country. Um, I'm honored to be here. My name is Kevin Williams. I've been in law enforcement for 43 years. I started out with the Detroit Police Department, um, which is the city in which I grew up in. And I'm currently serving as um, an interim assistant vice president for police here at Middle Tennessee State University. I've worked a number of departments. I've been a chief five times, all on college campuses. I have worked municipal law enforcement, and as a matter of fact, on March 3rd, 1991, Sunday, uh, I was employed by the Los Angeles Police Department, and that is the day that the California Highway Patrol went in pursuit of Rodney Glenn King, and then LAPD took over, and you know the rest of that story. Uh, at that time, I was in detective school. My hair was fried, dyed, laid to the side. I'm working narcotics, asset forfeiture. I had it made. And I went into um, one of the commanders at police headquarters uh, that Monday morning after having watched both of the Rodney King videos, because there were two, and uh, one that was rarely seen by the public. And I apologized. And the commander says, I know you weren't out there. I got the whole list. And I said, no, I apologize because I'm having fun as a detective, I'm living the life, but I needed to be out in the field as a police sergeant because if that had been me, that would not have happened. A lot of people do not know that there were over 80, 80 police officers from Los Angeles Police Department that were disciplined um, due to the Rodney King incident. Um, and I actually speak to that and it's, it's on YouTube if you wanna Google me. But uh, the bottom line is, why did I get into law enforcement? Because I hated cops. I grew up in the hood in Detroit. And every time I turned around, they were kicking ass and taking names. And I just got sick of it. And I was complaining to my mother about it. She says, well, stop complaining. If you think you can do better, become one. And then when I applied, she said, oh, no, 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 Kevin. I, I didn't really want you to become one, but it was, it was too late and uh, that was, 43 years ago, and just like uh, Chief Davis, um, I serve all people, all people. And I do not allow that monkey business to occur in my department. I hold people accountable. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. And again, um, this job is not easy. Being a police chief is not easy, not at all. But you have to, have to have the right people to step up to do this job. And uh, that's why we're here. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate everyone's genuine um, perspective. And your, uh, this is built to be a candid uh, conversation. Um, the, the matter and the, the topic that we're discussing uh, is important. Um, and so it's, it's very critical for us to have genuine, meaningful conversation. I appreciate all of you and for the work that you are doing to make an impact uh, in our communities. Uh, and I say our communities, uh, that, and that means nationwide. Um, and so definitely, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the role of race and how that plays out in your profession. And so I want to provide uh, some statistics that I think is very important. Uh, according to uh, data USA compiled. Now, this is from 2018. 85.3% um, of police officers were male, um, and 66.5% of those police officers were white, non Hispanic. Hence, while white males make up one third of the US population, yet the majority of law enforcement officers are white males. Uh, so, do you believe? 
understanding the demographics of law enforcement across the country, do you believe the racial demographics play a role in race relations with the communities of color? And I'm looking forward to um, our chiefs to, to speak on that. And so uh, Chief Davis, if you could uh, respond first, followed by uh, Chief Williams. Yes, sir. Um, race, in a, in a nutshell, race absolutely plays a huge part in the relationship and the interaction between law enforcement and communities of color. So uh, let me kind of put that in the, in the proper context in which I mean is that, it, so it's from a couple of different standpoints. You gave a little bit of the history of law enforcement. Uh, some more history of law enforcement moving forward, you know, we talk about slave catchers and things to that effect. And then you move forward to the civil rights era when, uh, when Jim Crow laws were being enforced, where who, who, who were the people that were, we got peaceful people out there marching, men, women, and kids in their Sunday best, uh, but they're being beat down by who? Law enforcement folks. And then you move forward uh, a little bit further in the, the, the war on drugs and uh, getting tough on crime and the, the disproportionate uh, incarceration of, of black folks. And, you know, looking at during the, during the, the crack epidemic and you got folks that'll get caught, you get caught with uh, a couple rocks to crack, uh, you get a, a sentence this large and you get caught with a little bit of power, a lot of powder and you get, a, if anything, you get something. So there's, there's just been inequities as far as law enforcement and dealing with communities of color. So that culture has just been embedded in law enforcement and the criminal justice system and the inequities that come along with it. That is just part of the culture. And that and, until that changes, we can implement all the legislation that we want until we crack that nut of changing that culture and attack it head on. We, legislation has to be a part of it, but that has to be a major component of us dealing with it. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is, it's just that from a cultural standpoint, our experiences are different. And our, with our differing experiences, we relate with, with, to people differently because of our personal experiences. But you know what, because you haven't experienced something, if you truly want to empathize, we can help you to empathize, but you have to have a heart and a mind to want to be empathetic with those people that you are supposedly serving. So the culture that exists does not really put uh, those white men quite often in position to be empathetic with the folks that don't necessarily look like them when they're coming to their communities. It's not to say that, that it can't happen, but the system itself and how we how we train people, the, 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 the culture that we allow to exist and the, the values that we allow to exist within our police departments. We have to have people of color that are in there to share those experiences. And, and I, it's happened to me personally. I've, I've had friends that, one of my best friends coming up in law enforcement was a white guy who really didn't know a lot about black folks, but because of our relationship, we could talk honestly about things and I could share with him my perspective and he might not completely understand it, but he knows me. And just the, 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 the experiences that I would share with him gave him a differing view on how he dealt with folks. And when things didn't happen properly, just like Chief was saying, if I'd have been there, that wouldn't have happened. We can explain to folks that don't look like us how they need to step up, not when just black folks are, or black, their black peers are around, but because it's the right thing to do at all times. Uh, I can't tell you, I'm very vocal, very vocal. You know, when we, at the, at the levels that all of us are at, we, we're used to being in the room and being the only person. And quite often I'm very vocal when people say stuff that they may, they may intentionally or unintentionally say that have racial undertones. And, and, and I do it in a respectful and a professional manner, but I can't tell you the number of times where folks don't, that don't look like me came up to me afterwards during the break, after the meeting, Man, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad that, that made a lot of sense. I'm glad you said that. We got to get to the point where you say something. Don't they expect it from me? I need you to say something. And they often don't do that because they'll be ostracized or they believe they will by those folks that look like them. So until we're able to move to that point, uh, yes, absolutely, race plays a part. And, and we as black folks have to, those folks who are who want to be better, and there's a lot of good white officers and good people who want to do, who want things to be better. We need to partner with them and, and, and to collectively hold people accountable. Um, Chris, I'll uh, follow up and I say that uh, Chief Davis's experiences are very similar to mine. 
Um, I left municipal law enforcement uh, just over a decade ago to switch to academic law enforcement. I have not looked back. And the reason being is because our approach to law enforcement on college campuses is very different. The question has to do with racial demographics, but I wanna uh, speak to it within the context of working in college environments where our, which are extremely diverse. Uh, first of all, almost every college, the majority of the people on there are female. And then on top of that, uh, LGBT community, communities are welcomed in college environments and so forth. And so the police that I supervise, the police that I lead, the police that I manage, have to have a skill set that I assert is a bit higher than municipal law enforcement because they will not, they meaning the administration, always civilians, will not tolerate insensitivity toward their community. So yes, I say that uh, Chief Davis was right. I think he was absolutely right when he spoke to accountability, which to me is the primary failure. Um, I, I wanna point out Ferguson, um, Missouri, and we all know what happened there. But if you remember the governor at the time called a captain from the state police to come down to take over because the community had no confidence in their local police who had no relationship with the people in Ferguson. Yes, he happened to be black, but if he had been a person who was um, uh, more socially connected to the community, it would have been different. He probably would have been accepted if they knew him. So the direct answer to your question is yes. Yes, there is an issue, but there's also a solution. And the chiefs and sheriffs and directors of public safety should be held accountable for um, holding their staff accountable. Because I've seen officers of all races acting up. But to focus on your question, the answer is yes. And there's a lot that we can do about it. But it is the responsibility of the police chiefs, sheriffs, and directors of public safety, in addition to this additional factor. You want to fix this problem? Have more people step up to be police commissioners. Because I happen to be one of those people who believes that every law enforcement agency in this nation should have civilian oversight. So I'm not talking about sworn people as police commissioners. I'm talking about civilians. So let's use an example. William J. Bratton. Okay? William J. Bratton was the police commissioner in New York. A lot of people didn't know he wasn't sworn, he was a civilian. A lot of people didn't know that because they've been watching too much TV where they see that actor playing the police commissioner. Police commissioner is a civilian. If you look in Los Angeles, Los Angeles is led by five civilians, police commissioners, police chief reports to them. I absolutely believe civilian oversight is critical and civilians should be setting the policies for the police department that they have to follow that are aligned with what the expectations of the community are. I have that in every time I've been a chief on a college campus because there's nobody above me that's wrong. Okay, so I report to civilians. And have you, how often do you hear about problems on college campuses with the way that we interact with people? There's black students on campuses. Is it perfect? No, but how often are we making national news? Okay, they don't play that on college campuses. So there's something that we could be doing differently. And I assert that the, the college model is the solution. That's my assertion. I, I sincerely thank you for that. And I think that's one important thing that, you know, not only do we raise the problem, but also explore solutions. Um, that civilian oversight, I think is very critical uh, here in Cincinnati. Uh, we do have the collective bargaining agreement um, that has garnered some national attention um, in having that civilian oversight. Um, like with everything, there's political pushback, uh, you know, when it comes to every good. I think that is a very viable solution. Uh, I definitely want to get um, uh, Judge uh, Rucker into the conversation as well. Uh, I know that in previous conversation that in being an attorney, 
I learned that attorneys are basically historians. <laughs> There's a wealth of information that they need to have. And, and so beyond the historical context that I provided, um, you know, we talked about uh, law and order and how it was used politically. It was used uh, in 1964 with Barry Goldwater against Lyndon Johnson's presidential campaign. And so I'm curious to want to know your perspective on this continued use of politics of law and order and how that is showing up currently. Sure, um, you know, that one word or that one phrase that all of us are familiar with from political campaigns for judge, for prosecutor, for president, for governor, tough on crime. Those, those three words that, that you know, are, are, are the focus of that law and order concept tough on crime. I'm going to be a tough on crime judge. I'm going to be a tough on crime prosecutor. I'm going to be a tough on crime governor. Tough on crime has been used by Nixon. Tough on crime was used by Reagan. Tough on crime was actually used by Clinton. Tough on crime was most certainly used by uh, uh, President Trump. The problem is it's a political expedient way to encourage people to be fearful and how they allow uh, politicians and lawmakers to suppress our rights, to attack our Fourth Amendment freedoms, and to get people elected whose objective is to make these uh, assertions without being able to provide a solution. It, it allows us to be run by fear in, in our daily lives, just generally. Um, now, I, 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 I was elected five times. I ran for a state office and, and I come from a family who has been elected. I'm not a politician. I'm a brother who was in office and who was in politics. A politician, I don't, I don't claim. Politicians use those phrases and words like that in order to get the vote. Um, but it has been truly a phrase that has caused negative impacts on a system that now in 2021 across the country, people recognize needs adjustment. And, and unfortunately, it's taken a lot more time for us to get to the place of recognizing how to change things, how to be more progressive in how we deal with uh, mass incarceration, how we deal with bail reform, how we deal with sentencing. I mean, you know, we, we, as we talked about crack cocaine uh, versus powder cocaine was the way that we uh, had that law and order uh, idea encapsulated in federal law, and and it changed only after heroin became the primary drug of choice a few years ago, and the demographic of who was being locked up for heroin and who was impacted by it actually was changing. When I first started as a prosecutor, 80 to 70, 80 percent of my cases, um, particularly involving drugs, had to do with black folks. By the time I stepped off the bench, 78% of my cases, particularly involving drugs, had to do with white folks. And they were talking, well, we need to do treatment. We can't lock folks up. That's not how we get our way out of this. So, so politically, that, that idea of tough on crime and law and order has sounded good for campaigns, but it has been deleterious and, and detrimental and destructive to the ends of actually achieving what we consider justice for larger communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I definitely, I know the next question I had, I, I somewhat, somewhat was unpacked, you know, is navigating uh, the reality of being um, of the Black community and being in law enforcement. But I definitely want to, to stick a little bit about the solution with the civilian oversight. It was a question that came in and I want to uh, pose that and anyone can answer. Um, but what would any of you recommend um, who would you recommend contacting about civilian oversight in your community? And so this person is in Charleston, South Carolina. So this is great. This is a national conversation. And so if you, we have people who are listening to this and they like, that is a great idea. We need to have civilian oversight uh, in our community with our law enforcement. What are the steps that can be taken by citizens to attempt to get that started in, in the respective communities. So in 2001 in Cincinnati, we had uh, disturbances. We had riots here after a, an armed young black man was killed uh, by a police officer in our, in our downtown community. It was like the 19th murder of an unarmed black man in like nine years. And, and as a result, 
we had, uh, after the riots, we formed a commission called the Cincinnati Can Commission. And there was a lawsuit afterwards. Actually, a lawsuit may have been pending at the time this happened. And one of the things that came out of it was something called the Citizens Complaint Authority. The Citizens Complaint Authority is the Cincinnati version of our Citizen Oversight Board. And they hear complaints of police procedure, courteousness, and police misconduct as citizens and this is along with the office of municipal, excuse me, the uh, internal investigation, uh, the prosecutor's office. But this is the citizen aspect of that, and they review. They they can subpoena um, officers and witnesses. They can uh, grab records from the police department. They they review the police procedures. They are our citizen oversight board. Now I was part of the the effort to help to number one shape how it developed and uh, the powers that it has. And they're actually a renewal process right now for our collaborative agreement that was signed into being after that lawsuit was filed. You have to get the elected officials on board. You have to get, and it's extremely difficult, to get the police department on board. Um, the FOP, and we can talk about the dynamics of the FOP and how that um, it, it creates a barrier in a lot of communities to uh, the ability for communities to work together. But the police department has to have some amount of buy-in to recognize that whatever happens from that oversight board, there will actually be a consequence or an outcome because if it's just we're going to uh, issue a decision that criticizes what the police did without some consequence either for the officers or that internal investigation takes uh, uh takes recommendations for or that the police chief doesn't take and and you know either meet out um uh, meet out some type of punishment or say those are policies that we need to change as a result of how those things were actually being done um, then, it, then it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tiger without any claws and without any teeth. So you have to have buy-in from the elected officials because they want to actually create the body and provide the financial support for the for the oversight board to exist. You have to have police buy-in, and of course, then you have to have the community to buy in because who are the citizens who are going to be part of this oversight board? Have to be community engaged, aware, active, um, interested, open-minded citizens who can be part of that process. Um, so, but, but there are uh, federal models that citizens in any community can, can reach out to in order to get kind of a, uh, a, a blueprint or a design of how these citizen boards are created and how they operate and even how they can get funding. People can, people can find that information um, pretty readily online, but those are kind of the major players that have to be part of it in order for it to be created and to be successful. Chief Williams, did you want to uh, respond to that question as well? I know that you raised about uh, the commissioner um, being um, uh, in civilian. Uh, did you have anything to add to for that question? Uh, uh, yes, uh, very briefly. I'm going to use the city of Los Angeles as an example. They have five police commissioners. They are appointed by the mayor. Uh, the city charter uh, the, the policies there do not allow the police chief to set policy. Only the police commissioners, only the civilians can set policy. Most people don't know that. I think that's a good thing. Um, when I got to the University of Michigan for my oversight committee, it was established under the law. Two students, two faculty, two staff. Very diverse, and I didn't get to pick them. The students picked their two representatives. The faculty picked their two representatives. So the direct answer to the question that was posed is it depends upon where you live. Um, and in one of the states where I live uh, in Oregon, um, in, in that city, the police commissioners express interest to the city. They are vetted and then they are seated if appropriate on the police commission for a specific period of time. But the bottom line is people are marching, they're shouting, they're screaming, they're burning. They want change. Well, guess what? We've got systems already set up in many cities across this country to affect change. Civilians should be on these police commissions and on the types of boards that the judge was talking about. And if not, go to your city and get that established. Okay. And those are just some of my suggestions on how to do it. You no, know, one of one of the of, and, and I'm gonna go to you first, uh, uh, Chief Davis, with this with this question. Um, we brought up brought up culture, and about how the culture within law enforcement needs to change. Um, and so, um, 
is implicit bias or cultural competency training, should that be required uh, to be a part of the professional development uh, of, of law enforcement officers? Absolutely, I think it should. Uh, and actually here in the state of Illinois, it's part of legislation. Um, uh, it's part, it's part, so we've had a couple criminal justice reform bills uh, that have now, that are now law. We just, uh, uh, one just recently this year that was just sweeping, not something like never before, but there was a one several years ago and in both of them, they addressed training, specific training uh, as far as cultural competence and, uh, uh, an implicit bias, and and, I, and I've traveled long before uh, George Floyd was murdered, and even uh, before Michael Brown was murdered. I, I traveled a country, uh, teaching my colleagues, most who don't look like me, uh, about bias, implicit bias, and how to deal with uh, how the law enforcement deals with black folks at the end of the day. And I, I share with them up front that you know the things that I'm going to talk to you about it's gonna make you feel uncomfortable. And only those who want to get better will receive what I'm gonna tell you and, and they'll do something with it. But, and, and I share my personal experiences and implicit bias and cultural competency. Once again, those are cultural competency, competency is just that. We, are, and I mentioned it earlier, we're different as people. You know, we are not, not necessarily right, somebody's right or wrong, we're just different. And we, our, our lens is a little bit different as to how we view things. But in law enforcement, we have to serve everybody. So we need to be able to understand, even though I've never seen through other lenses, I need to be able to understand what those folks that look at, that, that see through those lenses may feel. So, you know, I, I share with my colleagues, I share with them that, you know, I talk about that history that we've talked about. Uh, I talk about my personal experiences, my worst two experiences with law enforcement. My worst two were when I was a police officer. And in both instances, the officers knew I was a police officer. And in one of those two instances, I was a police chief and the guy knew I was a chief, but told me he don't care. And they, they abused the power that they had. And, and, and those are just two instances. You know, we, we, we black folks, we black men, we got countless encounters and they don't have to have been to the extent where you, you, you know, it was a Rodney King or something like that, but just people abusing their authority as law enforcement officers and that being the order of the day, that being the culture and the expectation of how they deal with us in our community. And I tell folks when I teach my class is that we got a lot of black, black folks want, especially challenged communities, they want the police there, but they want the police there doing the right thing. They want people doing, the, they want police doing the right thing and they want to be treated fairly in doing the right thing. They want the people that are committing crimes in our communities to be arrested, but they want people to be treated properly when we do those things. And we have, we have to learn as a profession, we police those that are committing crimes and we serve the entire community and we respect everybody. Even if I'm arresting you, I might not respect what you've done, but I'm going to treat you with respect and equitably treat you so that we've got that, that process by which uh, it's, a, it's procedurally just. In a procedurally just process, uh, uh, folks, uh, no, nobody likes to go to jail, but they're more inclined to accept things if they know that they're getting a fair shake throughout the entire process. And when you get a process that you know what, you did what you did, and, and I, probably 99% of the people I've sent to prison from things from, from murder down to what child molestation, I could probably sit down with most of, the, most of them today, right now, and wouldn't have a problem with them. Because when I dealt with them, they did what they did, but I treated them as a person. And there's consequences for what you do. We grownups, we use consequences for what you do. And most people can respect that. So as it pertains to the biases, we have to, first of all, I, my colleagues, I tell them, we have to accept the things that our profession ha have done to black folks. And this is why black people feel that way. And, I, and, and it, it makes them real uncomfortable. Well, that was, you know, that's what they did back then. No, hold on, let, let me show you what's happened to me. And they do it wasn't a hundred years ago. This happened to me personally, and it still happens today. And if they're doing it to me as a police officer and a police chief, what are they doing to folks who aren't in that position? And how is leadership, and, and what, what kills me is when you talk to somebody within a police department and you tell them about somebody who, who's doing things they got no business to do, and they say, yeah, 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 that's, yeah, that's just so-and-so. Hold up, well, how is so-and-so being allowed to exist within your organization and you know that they're treating people like that? So it, 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 there's just so many different things to, 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 as far as bias is concerned, but 
those folks, once again, who want to be better, if you talk to them about bias and they acknowledge that there's bias and they want to get better, at the end of the day, my goal when I teach my classes on bias and I tell them up front is to put you in, posi in position to be able to empathize with folks. If you can empathize with somebody, you're gonna still do your job, but you're gonna do it in a total, through a totally different lens, no matter where you come from, because you're seeking to serve people and you're doing it in a way that, hey, you don't understand why this person is doing this. And if you do understand why they're doing it, you might not like what they're doing, but you're gonna treat them in a different way. So, you know, it, it absolutely is necessary. It's in legislation here in the state of Illinois and, you know, folks don't like it. And they, they, they think, you know, I'm gonna just go sit through this class, but those are those who don't wanna change. And as Chief Williams was talking about before, and as the judge has also talked about, we've got to hold folks accountable as leaders. And that's why we have to have like-minded leaders Black, white, or whoever you are, as long as you're holding your folks accountable that you're going to be treating people in an unbiased way, then we can try to move this, this thing forward. I want to uh, uh, shift just slightly with the conversation and explore training um, uh, in, in the profession of law enforcement. Police officers do enforce the law as a civic responsibility. However, lawyers, prosecutors, judicial positions, have to have either substantial educational experiences or ex extensive experience professionally to obtain those positions. Uh, with law enforcement officers, the requirements are far from the requirements of lawyers, prosecutors, and judges, uh, even though they are the ones that enforce the, the, uh, the law as a civic responsibility. Do you see a need uh, for change or reform in the length of the training class slash classes for uh, police academies and continuing education program for officers to replicate other standards required in government. And more so, instead of it being led up to a state legislation, like Chief Davis had talked about, for this possibly being a federal legis legis legislative act of increasing um, the training in uh, requirements of law, law enforcement. Uh, you know, your thoughts on that, and we'll start with Chief Williams, and then um, we'll go uh, to uh, Judge Fanon, and then I'll finish up with you, uh, Chief Davis. Uh, back in the 60s, the federal government uh, did some research and recommended that uh, all police officers should have a minimum of bachelor's degree before they spend one day out in the field. Um, I agree with that. That did not happen, but there are some colleges Corrections, there are some police departments that do require you to have a bachelor's degree. You asked a question about training. I strongly support an increase in training, at least six months. Would I like to see some federal standards? Absolutely, yes. You, we can't have a federal blanket standard for how a police uh, academy is run exclusively because of states' rights. And every state is different and the laws are different. So I do believe that those laws that apply nationally, yes, there should be a very standard practice of how those classes are delivered. And these uh, things like cultural competency should be required. It certainly is gonna be found in the training for every college campus. So yes, I agree. There should be consistent training to the degree it can be based upon the differences of state laws and it needs to be longer. And I say no academy should be less than six months. Yes, I, I absolutely agree. I'm, um, like I said, I, I ran for prosecutor here and I've been involved in a lot of police uh, uh, training issues and, and got several ideas about how to make that thing better. But I'm, I'm one who certainly believes that there has to be in order to, uh, for, for the people, to recognize that there is a just process or that there's justice in our system, that there has to be consistency of it. I'll give you an example. In Ohio, there are 88 different counties. In, in each of the counties, there are at least, you know, uh, 15 to 20 different jurisdictions, uh, police jurisdictions. In, in Hamilton County alone in Cincinnati, I think we have 50 because there are 49 different cities and townships. And then you got the University of Cincinnati, you got Xavier University, all have different individual standards about the policing um, uh, uh, procedures, 
whether this particular group says cut off on police chases or this one says go ahead, there should be some, con some consistent standards, not only state by state, but federally, so that the people can say, look, I, I, I know what behavior is expected. I also know what um, what what as a as a uh, as a police agency we can expect they're going to do and not do, and it also helps the courts when they're deciding whether or not people should be held to the standards that they are. Now I will offer to you though that one of the scariest things that I learned about being a judge, there is no training to be a judge, particularly those places where um, as here we are elected. So I became a judge in April of 2007, it wasn't until November that I had my first judge class. But by then I already had several thousand cases. What I had to rely on was my life experience and my professional experience as a prosecutor, defense attorney, and a civil rights lawyer, and what I had done as a trial lawyer. But police officers have the ability of life and death in their very hands every single day at every single instance where they come in contact with the citizen. The idea that in Ohio, and the governor talked about this, barbers, in Ohio, in order to be certified as a barber requires more hours in Ohio than to be a police officer. That's heavy. And so that is an advocacy point for federal standards requiring, you know, uh, best practices in order for all agencies across the country to have a minimum place where they need to start at. And it should be higher than barbers who are cutting your hair and not <laughs> having guns um, pointed at your heads and tasers when they come in contact. I'm in total agreement with you all. Um, so here in the state of Illinois, um, I am the chairman. I was appointed by our governor last year. I'm the chairman uh, uh, and I'm the first black chairman of the Training and Standards Board here in the state of Illinois, which oversees all certifications and training for police academies otherwise. And I'm the first black person to be chairman of that. I'm also this year, I became the president of the Illinois uh, Police Chiefs Association, the first black person in the 80 year history of that organization, that statewide organization. So I, I say that to say I, I have those positions, but they come with great responsibility because the things that we're talking about, and, and I mentioned, I, I alluded to it earlier that I'm blessed to be in positions now where I have a responsibility while I'm in these positions to affect productive change from my lens, because my lens is different and them folks the previous 80 years and the people that were the, the, the chairman those years before me on the training and standards board. And absolutely, we need to make sure that we have effective training. But for train for me, I don't, I don't think our job requires us to uh, absolutely more education, more training will never hurt anybody. But I believe that we have to start focusing more on the heart and the head. And what do I mean by that? I, I don't need the person that, 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 that can go in and fight 10 people by themselves and all and, and come out unscathed. I need somebody that can problem solve, that's, going, that's got a heart, that's gonna help people and, and solving those, because I can teach you how to fight. I can teach you how to fight. I can teach you how to shoot, to be able to protect yourself and protect those that we serve. But I, I can't teach you to have a heart. And I can't teach you to want to be a person that, that's going to be empathetic with those that we serve. Uh, uh, there's a saying that, that I heard, and I, and I use it all the time now, that, uh, you know, uh, that culture eats legislation, eats training for lunch. We can train people up all we want, but if we, if we can train them up all we want. Uh, uh, we can put all the legislation, but those of us who've been to the police academy, First day you sit in the chair uh, with, with your field training officer, they tell you, okay, I know, I know you learned some stuff in the academy. Well, I'm gonna show you how it's, how it's really done. That's the culture. So it's not necessarily a bad thing for somebody to tell you that, but it depends on what, how it's really done is interpreted and how it's taught. So absolutely we need more training, but I think that focus has got to be on the heart and the head and attacking that culture at that we can do, we do, all this other stuff and we don't address the culture head on and making change in that culture, it's gonna be all for naught. I th and I thank you for that. And that is right on point for this one question that came in and is actually gonna be part of my next question. And so please uh, question uh, uh, in the chat uh, is, is there too much hiring from former military? Um, that is the question. Because uh, said it doesn't seem to be a compatible to uh, the culture 
that you talked about with the heart and the head. Um, and so, but, but with that, um, one of the things that I learned from last year when we had this conversation with law enforcement, I often heard uh, the message of demilitarizing the police. But the biggest takeaway I have from last year's conversation is that law enforcement is actually an extension of the military. And, and I came to that conclusion after having several conversations. And then we have a police museum here in Cincinnati. And a good portion of that museum talks about military service. So I'm, I'm curious to know what is your perspective on the militarization of police, uh, but also this idea of, of hiring, you know, former uh, uh, individuals from the military uh, of them getting, I guess, uh, presumed to get a nod into this profession a little bit easier because of that military background. And uh, uh, we can we can begin with uh, 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 Chief Davis. I mean, Chief, we can begin with you, Chief Davis, and followed by Chief Williams. So for me, uh, it's a matter of, uh, from a leadership standpoint, it's a matter of your perception of militarization. What, what is the actual definition? So for me, there's a, so, uh, you know, where they say that law enforcement is a, is a you know, it's, it's a paramilitary organization. As I, I view that in my organization as a structural definition. So, you know, we have the hierarchy, you have the, the, the ranks and things to that. So from a structural point, that's how I view it. Uh, for others, it, it very well may be that, you know, it, it's the, 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 you know, folks who have been in the military are, are presumed to have been used to discipline, uh, for operating in a disciplinary fashion, more so than civilians are and, and, and reporting to authority. So that from a structural standpoint. Uh, but then there are those that, you know, when you're in the military, you got a different, diff, different mindset when you're at war than when you're serving folks. And so, that that is how some people look at it as well. So when you talk about uh, giving them giving them a nod or, or giving them extra points for being in the military, once again, I, I think it's how you how, how you as a leader utilize it. And when I look at it, you know, our, our veterans are quite often they you know they they come home they have challenges, and I look at it as giving them a little leg up because of their service to the country, not because I need somebody who can fire an AK better than somebody who hasn't been to the military. That's, but that's me as a leader. There are other leaders who may look at it through that other lens. I need somebody who can handle a weapon and who's not scared to go put hands on somebody. And, and so it's going to depend on leadership. And, uh, and, and we talk about demilitarization for me, you know, and, and our new legislation here in the state of Illinois, they wanted to do away with anything from an equipment standpoint you know, the, the military sometimes will give us old equipment to our, for our departments. And um, so I was against getting rid of all those things because in law enforcement, there are uses. There are in extreme cases that we actually do, you know, because we get called for the worst of the worst and we need to be adequately equipped. But once again, that goes back to leadership and how are you utilizing that? All right, do you have a tank out there when you got peaceful protesters on the street? Or do you have that tank out there? Because we just had in our town, we got a barricaded subject who's holding hostages in a house. And do I send my, and we wanna get those, those, those hostages out of there. Do I wanna send my officers up there? This person already got hostages. They've already shot somebody. Do I wanna send other officers up there to risk their life? Or do I wanna have a bear cat that can go up front and use the front of the Bearcat and knock the front door down so that we can go in and we can see inside and send a robot inside. So that usage, absolutely, I believe is something, but it's, it's measured, it's only in extreme cases. It's not every time you're out there uh, and, and you know somebody's peacefully protesting, you follow them with a tank down the street and you got guys with their, with their ARs walking alongside of them, absolutely not. So uh, it's, it's all about leadership in my eyes and I understand that everybody doesn't see it the same way I do. So as leaders, they may use it in different in ways that I believe are inappropriate. So I understand completely why people may feel as though that demilitarization may be necessary. 
Okay, uh, my response is um, I support our military, all the branches of our military. Um, I have former, uh, I have veterans that work for me in my police department and have in many instances, and they've done exceptionally well. I rarely have had issues with veterans that work for me in the departments that I've worked. I, I thank them for their service. I welcome them as candidates for my department. But it gets back to what Chief Davis said. It's all about accountability, okay? I'm not looking for people with a warrior mindset. And so the question was framed more like, what about people with a warrior mindset? They mentioned military, they mentioned veterans, but that's really what they're talking about, okay? I don't want ghetto gunfighters and I don't want uh, uh, people with a warrior mindset. You must have a guardian mindset working in my environment on a college campus. You won't last a week with a warrior mindset. You will be unemployed. It's my responsibility, it's our respons responsibilities as chiefs to vet these people. And when they are not appropriate for our de departments to remove them. Now with respect to militarization of the police, my dear departed friend, Nick Zingo, was the lieutenant on duty the day of the Bank of America shooting in North Hollywood. And our officers, I was on duty that day. I was not at the scene, he was. And our officers were severely outgunned. Multiple officers shot, multiple officers down. He made the decision to go down to, go, to send people down to the local gun store to get additional armament in order to be able to address the threat at hand. So do I believe that we need to have those tools? Absolutely. But I do not believe that we should be doing some of the things that I've seen, like he talked about driving tanks down the street and, and using AR-15s and daily patrol to point at people and all that nonsense. Absolutely not. I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it because it is our responsibility to serve the community where we are employed. The last thing I'm gonna say is this, most people don't know Ohio State University has a bear cat. They've had one for probably 10, 15 years. You ever heard of it being misused? Ever? I'll wait. It has to do with leadership and it has to do with the appropriate use of those tools. And when police departments misuse those tools, they need to be yanked or fire the chief and bring somebody in there that's got their hair screwed on right. I'm done. Thank you, thank you, Chief Williams. Uh, anything you would like to add uh, uh, to this aspect, um, Judge Rucker? No, I'll yield to the professionals who make <laughs> the, the leadership decisions on that every day. Absolutely, absolutely. It comes down to leadership. You know, uh, I want to want to say that you know we are getting an hour in, um, and so if you do have uh, any. Uh, questions, please pose them in the chat at this time. Um, but I just want to revisit some some things that uh, we had discussed, you know, talked about solutions, um, talked about having uh, accountability um, uh, 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 by our law enforcement officers, but also uh, looking to have um, civilian oversight. Um, we talked about culture. How do we confront the culture that has existed in law enforcement? Um, and so, and one of the things that I, I believe uh, Chief Williams just said, he talked about a warrior mindset versus a guardian mindset. I wanna pause on that for a moment. Um, a guardian mindset, that is someone who is willing to serve. I often have had conversation with the many friends that I have in law enforcement that I love and respect. But I tell them, you are in a profession to where you almost at times surrender your right to come home because of the profession that you have and the elements that you deal with. Um, and so I often hear, you know, um, I'm trying to, I'm just trying to make it to go home to my family at night. But I think everybody's trying to do that, I would hope, you know, regardless of what your profession is. But um, from my as a civilian, um, I respect the position greatly because I think it is a sacrifice. I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add 
uh, to, to, to that thought process of, you know, of getting into, you know, this profession, you are making a sacrifice uh, in doing that to your, to, to, to your health, uh, as well as to um, your well-being of coming home to your family. Well, absolutely, it is a sacrifice, and and that's something that needs to be discussed up front when before people get into this profession, because, you know, you, you talk about especially you know since uh, COVID, you know, talk about first line, front line people and first responders being heroes, and uh, you've heard people say those things, but there's a lot of things that come with this. First and foremost, as Black folks, it's our community. Uh, as I told you, I, I when I came into this, I I, I didn't. Oh, no, my, I didn't grow up wanting to be a police officer, but when I got here, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be that guy that goes to our community, and I'm going to be the officer that I always wanted to, to, to deal with, and, uh, you know, I'm going to be the example, I'm going to do help my community out, and you know what, uh, I, I got out there, I went to the, to, to the community, and I get out there, and they're like, you're Uncle Tom, you're a sellout, you ain't black, you blue now. And so I have to be honest with you. And early on in my career, I really, that, that bothered me. And cause I'm like, no, no I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm that guy. I'm not, I'm like, I'm not like them, but there are folks out there who are of that mindset. And it, it, it weighed on me as a, as a person. And, and though I'm trying to do the right thing, that's something I had to learn how to deal with and, and dealing with, uh, our people and, and that, they, you know what, there's some folks need to go to jail and I can't hold myself because they've done something wrong. I had, it's, it's on, that's on them what they did. And I have to be able to, whatever they have to say, I, I can't internalize those things, but that's something I had to grow to do. It's not normal to walk into a house and see a dad and three babies that have just been gunned down in a home invasion. But our people, I, I, our people take have to have to deal with that kind of stuff, and something in, in our in our new legislation here in the state of Illinois, they talk about officer wellness, and one big thing is people. If somebody says, "Okay, I want you to go out there and deal with people who are doing the craziest things in society," I, I'm gonna put you on that front line. But you know what? Uh, you know, if, if if I find out, you know, if the, uh, the public hears that, hey, Mitch Davis got an alcohol problem or Mitch Davis has got a drug problem, he should be fired. He ain't got no business being in that profession, but they may not know that Mitch Davis got a drug problem or alcohol problem because of the things that he's subjected to every day. And if he tells somebody about it, then he might lose his job because the, the perception is, you know what, we can't have you on the street. So some things that they've changed here in the state of Illinois is to make sure that it's, it's mandated now that every year officers have to have some type of psychological evaluation just to make sure they're okay. And as leaders, we're providing programs like peer support because the people are more likely to talk to their peers when something is going wrong. And there's a, there's a, here, there's a groundbreaking facility here in the state of Illinois whereby it's called St. Michael's House, that if we have officers who have substance abuse problems, where they can go, it's, not, it's at a hospital, but it's segregated from the rest of the hospital and they can go in there without fear of the press finding out that they're in there. And, and, and you know, once again, if, if I'm going to lose my job and people find out I, I'm, on, I'm on dope, for whatever reason I'm on there, I ain't going to try to get no help for being on dope because I don't want to lose my job. I'm just going to deal with it. And then I'm really going to make mistakes out there. So, it absolutely, there's a, absolutely a lot of things that come with this and it, 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 it can weigh on you. It, that we see things that most people will never see in their lives. And I, I share with folks, I spoke at a, a graduation from the Chicago Police Academy a couple months ago and I, I reminded these new recruits that in, mo in many instances, you're gonna be meeting people on the worst day of their lives. And you have to remember that that when you're talking to people, you're dealing with people, but also you got to make sure you're okay. Because once again, it ain't, it ain't normal to be seeing a baby that's been shot in the face and you trying to revive this baby. And we can't put that weight on our officers and expect them to carry that load and not there without any repercussions. We've got to offer them help and we got to let folks know up front that it's okay not to be okay because we will get you help and you won't lose your job as a result of it. I, I have a I have a quite I have a 
uh, uh, something just came to my mind while you were speaking and I'm looking at the chat um, as well um, as we are coming to a close. And I feel this is important to bring up this aspect. One, you're talking about public education. Um, I, I, I'll address that right quickly. I, I, I do, I'm a firm believer. Um, right now, there's a lot of rhetoric about critical race theory. And even though it has never been legislated into school, they're trying to legislate it out. Um, but I think there needs to be this cultural competency in, in training. We're talking about law enforcement should have. Our, our public in general, need to have that cultural competency training, need to have that implicit bias training, not just for law enforcement, for everybody. So while we're trying to uh, restrict uh, talking about race in the classroom, we need to embrace by having these critical conversations uh, in the uh, classroom and have it be part of the public educational curriculum. The one thing, the other aspect is, um, is you talked about mental health, and I think that goes both ways because one of the comments was it can't all be on law enforcement um, when you have an encounter. But I will argue to say this, if you have a situation, a citizen, as you said, you are seeing them on their worst day. They may respond and act irrationally. Matter of fact, we just saw it recently here in the city of Cincinnati. A, 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 a father felt that his family was in harm. And although law enforcement was there to uh, address the situation, he felt compelled to grab his firearm. And, 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 and the law enforcement officer, Officer Mack, did an outstanding job of, of identifying the humanity and de-escalated the situation and to where the man was eventually, uh, uh, he was taken to custody. Uh, and matter of fact, they had a conversation afterwards. And he, in fact, apologized, said, I did something that was stupid. But that officer showed restraint, he showed humanity. And often what we do see is we see a devalue of humanity and understanding that this person is having a bad day and we understand officers might be having a bad day as well because of what they went through. So maybe there might be a need for social workers to be involved in situations, not only for law enforcement, but also for the people that might be called on the scene. What would you say about uh, uh, having that level of um, that element of social workers and people who are, are trained to deal with these mental issues being involved? and working collaboratively with law enforcement? Well, I personally think that's a great idea, but we have to make sure that those people are safe because there are gonna be situations that are extremely volatile. We've gotta make sure that law enforcement has, uh, has uh, de-escalated the situation to the point that it's safe for the non-sworn, the unarmed people to come in and take over. Um, this lunacy of sending mental health experts only to certain calls is going to have tragic results. Now, I did see the message in the, uh, the chat, and it happens to be from one of our frat brothers uh, asking about educating the public. And I, because I know him so well, I know where he's coming from. He, we've had many conversations about why isn't there more effort to educate, to teach, uh, to share with people why they need to comport themselves a certain way when they interact with the police. I happen to agree, but I'm gonna tell you something, that horse has left the barn. Because when people are seeing uh, what they're seeing in national media, um, you name it, they're seeing all these things that are being projected over and over and over and over again. There's a myopic, a very myopic view that is the police uh, after us and they're harming us and they're hurting us and they're killing us even though we're unarmed. The data tends to say something a tad bit different from the reality because here's the reality. The Washington Post has done an extraordinary job of tracking lethal uh, interactions with police over the last five years. Please take a look at their data. They've looked at every death at the hands of police for the last five years. And here's the average, the average is a police kill about a thousand people in the United States. 
That's all 50 states and territories combined. It's about 1,000 people a year. Of that, about 250 of them on average is, is, are black. That includes, yeah, I saw the look on your face. Now, let me break that down for you real quick. Out of the approximately 1,000 people that are being killed by police every year, one fourth, 25% are black. Now that number doesn't um, relate to what the narrative is in our community, but you can break that down two different ways. Here's the first way. We represent about 12 to 13% of people in the United States but 25% of the people getting killed by the police are black. So we're at double, double the average based upon our representation in the community. However, when you look at 250 people that are black that are killed by police every year, and that's what the, that's factual data, go to Chicago. We, people like, that look like us, gentlemen, are dropping our brothers left and right and we ain't doing a damn thing about us killing us. Now, those are two different topics. I understand that. But I swear I wish we were doing more to save our brothers. And that's just Chicago. That's just one city. Just one city. You're losing double the number that police have killed in the entire nation. People don't want to hear that, though. And then when you really break it down to how many of us Black people were unarmed, it averages 17 to 19 a year. But on the street, you believe it's happening 30 times a week. So we need to, so education is critically important. It needs to occur. It absolutely must occur. But at the same time, we need to deal with the accountability that some of our chief peers are failing to do as it relates to addressing issues. Now, if I could take just two more minutes, I want to point something out. There's two Supreme Court cases, Tennessee versus Garner and Graham versus Connor, that are the litmus test that this nation uses to assess whether or not the lethal use of force by police um, was lawful. Okay, And that's the reason why those two Supreme Court cases are the reasons why almost every use of lethal force is determined to be lawful. It's because of the Supreme Court. So these decisions have been around for quite some time. Why aren't we educating the public to let them know that? So if they did not agree with these decisions, maybe they would have voted. But our last president just put three people on the Supreme Court, which means hell is gonna freeze over before things change at the national level. That's why I, as a chief, tell my officers, I'm gonna assess your tactics that you used before you got into a situation where you could lawfully use force. And if you think you were dirty hair and you can see a car coming down the street towards you and you're on the sidewalk and you walk out onto the street and step in front of that car and now you are in fear of your life and you pull out a gun and you shoot, I'm gonna fire you for improper tactics. We need to take this thing to a whole different level in terms of our assessment of police use of force. It's a different conversation, but yes, we do need to educate the community and yes, we need to hold our people accountable. I'm done. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you for, uh, for your insight. Um, uh, we are getting uh, short on time. Um, and, and so I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. I want to be respectful of everyone that has joined us live here today. The comments are coming in. Um, you know, I, I believe, lastly, you know, th those statistics uh, that you mentioned, you know, um, a thousand uh, police um, uh, um, uh, killings uh, occurring annually, um, the percentage that you gave, 25% of those uh, being African American although African-Americans make up 12% of the national population. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it, it's important for us to look at those numbers. Um, and I think overall, um, what was used before is cold. And so in, in closing, you know, I, I definitely want to, uh, to, to talk about culture. 
um, not only and with the understanding that laws and policies reflect our values. We here at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, we celebrate people who worked against the law and order of policy during the 19th century. Uh, enslavement was legal. And we celebrate people who were lawbreakers, who helped um, people to freedom, who had a embraced a culture of humanity, embraced a culture of, of freedom, inclusive freedom. And so what we want to continue to do is use that to fuel us here today in 2021. We, we have we have, and it comes down to picking the type of leaders that is inclusive uh, uh, that had in culture, uh, wanting to uh, meet the needs of all citizens, not just some, but all as much as uh, possible and fair and equitable and most importantly, objective. And so hopefully we can bring some objectivity to all facets of our society. Um, and so, I definitely uh, want to do that. For now, I want to have a rebuttal reserve. <laughs> so I'm going to, uh, 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 before we, we log off, for now, I'm going to actually uh, uh, give you the floor uh, before we close out. No, no, no. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want us to end on a on a position of an open of an open debate. Um, <laughs> I, I'll just offer that. And, and, and like I said, before I became a judge, I was a civil rights lawyer. So what we talk about are the fewer instances where there's lethal interactions, but there are increased numbers of host hostile interactions that don't result in death that do actually um, have much higher instances of, of black and brown folks. And you can look at public record requests from almost every agency. I, I did it here in the city, and I know it's consistent across the country. There may not be uh, deaths in custody, but there are greater uses of non-lethal force. So MACE, um, um, oh God, PR 24s, and we had, them. Uh, that's why I said, I don't want to get into the, the open end debate, but I'll just say there is a different position that can be offered, acknowledging that we got issues in our own community that we got to deal with. Ain't no doubt about it, but that does not give license to others to abuse us in the process. So, so like I said, I'm asking for part two, so we can, we can open up that part of dialogue as well. Well, absolutely. The, the, the ideal is we're not going to solve everything uh, within uh, uh, the hour and 15 minutes that we've been uh, engaged in this conversation. But we hope that we've challenged and inspired people to find solutions and answers. I want to thank all of you uh, for uh, participating. Definitely want to thank our sponsors, Gallagher uh, 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 Insurance, uh, for being a sponsor for uh, the, the, this this program this evening, uh, please, please uh, take the survey or put the survey link in the chat to let us know uh, your feelings, your thoughts about this program. Um, please visit our website, freedomcenter.org for upcoming programming that we will have. The next uh, Unmasking the Realities uh, program will be on September 22nd uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, it will be a conversation about community and about uh, uh, racial healing. And so we hope that you join us on September 22nd, but please visit our website, freedomcenter.org for all our outstanding programming that we have, as well as our gala that will take place October 16th. Um, if you feel inclined to participate, to donate to us, please do so that we can continue to do the work to educate the public. Once again, on behalf of our, our staff, our volunteers, we thank you for joining us. Thank you for this outstanding panel. Thank you brothers for joining us uh, for this conversation. And all of you have a blessed evening and the rest of your week. Thank you. <laughs>